Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special CUBE conversation here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE in the CUBE studios. We've got a special video here. We love when we have startups that are launching. It's an exclusive video of a hot startup that's launching, got great reviews so far. You know, Word on the Street they got something different and unique. We're going to dig into it. I meet Govern, who's the CEO and co-founder of Kubia, which stands for CUBE in Hebrew. <laughs> and they're headquartered in, Pal in Bay Area and in Tel Aviv. I mean, congratulations on the startup launch and, and thanks for coming in and talking to us in theCUBE. Thank you, John, very, very nice to be here. So first of all, a little, because we love theCUBE, because theCUBE's kind of an open brand. <laughs> um, we've course. never seen theCUBE in Hebrew. So is that true? The cube, Kubia is? Kubia literally means cube. Um, you know, clearly there's some uh, additional meanings that we can discuss. Uh, obviously, uh, we're also launching a KubeCon, so there's a dual meaning to uh, to this event. <laughs> KubeCon, not to be confused with KubeCon, which <laughs> is an event we might have someday and compete. No, I'm only kidding. Um, good stuff. I want to get into the startup because I'm intrigued by your story. One, mm -hmm. um, you know, conversational AI has been around, it's been a category. We've sure. seen chatbots be all the rage. And you know, I kind of don't mind chatbots on some sites. I can interact with some you know, form-based knowledge graph, whatever knowledge database, and get basic stuff self-served. So you see that, but it never really scaled or took off. And now with cloud native kind of going to the next level, we're starting to see a lot more open source and a lot more automation in what I call AI as code or you know, AI as a service, machine learning, developer focused action. Okay. So I see, to me, I think you guys might have an answer there. So if you don't mind, could you take a minute to explain what you guys are doing? What's different about Kubia? What's happening? Certainly, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, Kubia is um, what we would consider the first or one of the first um, advanced virtual assistants uh, with the domain uh, specific expertise in DevOps. So we respect all of the DevOps concepts GitOps, uh, you know, all, all workflow automation, all of the uh, of, of those categories you've mentioned, but also the added value of the conversational AI. That's really uh, one of the, the few elements that we can really bring to the table to extract what we call uh, intent-based operations. And we can get into what that means in a little bit. I'll save that maybe for, for the next question. Yeah, so. so the market you're going after is kind of, it's always, I love to hear startups when they, they don't have a Gartner magic quadrant. They can fit <laughs> nicely and sure. they're onto something. Um, what is the market you're going after? Because you're seeing a lot of developers driving a lot of the, the key successes in DevOps. DevOps has evolved to the point where, and DevSecOps, where sure. developers are driving the change. And so having something that's developer focused is key. Are you guys targeting the developers, IT buyers, cloud architects? Who are you looking to serve with this new opportunity? So essentially self-service in the world of DevOps, uh, the end user typically would be a developer, but not only, uh, and obviously the operators. Those are the folks that we're actually looking to help uh, augment a lot of their efforts, uh, a lot of the toil that they're experiencing in a day-to-day. -day. So there are subcategories within that. We can talk about the different internal developer tools uh, or platforms, uh, shared services platforms, service catalogs, or tangential uh, categories that, that this kind of comes on. But on top of that, we're adding the element of conversational AI, which uh, as I mentioned, that's, that's really the, the got you. Yeah, I think you're starting to see a lot of autonomous stuff going on. Autonomous pen testing. There's a company out there <laughs> doing that. You're seeing autonomous AI. Automation is a big theme of it. And I got I to gotta ask, are you guys on the business side purely in the cloud? Are you born in the cloud? Is it a cloud service? What's the product um, choice there? It's a service, right? Software as a service. Uh, we have the classic uh, multi-tenancy SaaS, uh, but we also have a hybrid SaaS solution. Uh, which allows our um, customers to, to run uh, workflows uh, using remote runners essentially uh, hosted at their own location. So primary cloud, but you're agnostic on where they can consume, how they want to consume the product. Technology agnostic. Okay, got it, okay, so that's cool. So let's get into the problem you're solving. So take me sure. through, this will drive a lot of the value. Because <laughs> sure, sure. When you guys did the company, what problems did you hone in on and what are you guys seeing as the core problem that you solve? So, we, this is a unique, I don't know how unique, but this is an interesting uh, proposition because I come from the business side. So call it the top down. I've been in enterprise sales. I've been in a CRO, VP sales hat. Uh, my co-founder 
comes from the bottom down, uh, bottom up, right? He, he uh, ran DevOps teams and SRE teams in his previous company. That's actually what he did. So we met each other halfway, <laughs> essentially, uh, with me seeing uh, a lot of these uh, problems of self-service not being so self-service after all. Platforms um, hitting walls with adoption and he actually created his own self-service platform within his last company uh, to address his own personal pains. So we essentially kind of met with, with the, both perspectives. So you're absolutely hardcore on self-service. We're enabling self-service. Yeah, yep. and that's, that basically is what everybody wants. I mean, every, the developers want self-service. I mean, that's kind of like, <laughs> sure. you know, <laughs> that's the nirvana. So take us through what, what do you, take us through what you guys are offering. Give us an example of use cases and, and who's buying your product, why, and, and take us through that whole piece. Do you mind if I take a step back and say why we believe self-service has sure. yeah. somewhat failed <laughs> or yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not, not gotten off? Yeah, so, absolutely. So look, uh, this is essentially how, how we're looking at it. Uh, all the analysts in the industry insiders are talking about self-service uh, platforms as being what's going to remove the dependency of uh, the operator in the loop the entire time, right? Because the operator, that's a scarce resource. It's hard to hire, hard to train, hard to retain those folks. Uh, developer, um, developers are obviously dependent on them for productivity. So the operators in this case could be a DevOps, could be a SecOps, it could be a platform engineer. It comes in different, in different flavors. But... The common denominator, somebody needs an access request, provisioning a new environment, you name it, right? They go to somebody, that, that person is the operator. The operator typically has a few things on their plate. It's not just <laughs> attending and babysitting platforms, but it's also innovating, spinning up uh, and scaling services. So they see this typically as kind of we don't really want to be here. <laughs> we're going to go and, and do this because we're on call. We, we have to take it on the chin, if you may, <laughs> for this. Uh, for it's this their job. They got to do it. Right. Uh, but it's KTLOs, right? Keep the lights on. This is uh, maintenance of a platform. It's not, it's not what they're born and bred to do, which is innovate. And, and that's essentially what we're seeing. We're seeing that a lot of these platforms, once they finally hit the point of maturity, they're rolled out to the team. People come to serve themselves in the platform, and lo and behold, it's not as self-service as yeah. it may seem. Yeah, and that, we've seen that, too, certainly with Kubernetes, adoption being, I won't say slow, it's been fast, but it's been good, but I think this is kind of the promise of what SRE was supposed to be. You know, do it exactly. once and then babysit in the sense of, it's working and automated, nothing's broken yet, don't call me unless you need something. I see that, so the mm -hmm. question, you're, you're trying to make it easier then. You're trying to free up the talent. Talent to operate and have essentially a human-like in the loop, uh, yeah. essentially augment that person and give, him, uh, give the end users the need, um, all of the answers they require as if they're talking to a person. In the yeah, loop. I mean, it's basically you're taking the virtual assistant concept or chatbot to a level of Precise. expertise where there's intelligence, jargon, experience mm -hmm. into the workflows that's known, not just I'm talking to a chatbot, get a support number to rebook a hotel room. We're converting <laughs> operational workflows into conversations. Give me an example. Show, take me through an example. Sure. Um, let's, let's take a simple example. I mean, not everyone provisions EC2s in <laughs> today's <laughs> environment. Uh, but let's say you, you want to go and provision a new EC2 instance. Okay. Um, if you wanted to do it, you could go and talk to um, the assistant and say, I want to spin up a new server. If it was a human in the loop, they would ask you the following questions. What type of environment? <laughs> okay, what are we attributing this yeah. to? What type of instance? Okay, um, security groups, machine images, you name it. So these are the questions that typically somebody needs to be armed with before they can go and provision themselves, serve themselves, okay? Now the problem is users don't always have these questions. Mm -hmm. So imagine the following scenario. Somebody comes in, they're in a Jira ticket queue. <laughs> they finally, their turn is up. And the next question, they don't have the answer to. So now they have to go and tap on a friend or they have to go essentially and, and get that answer. By the time they get back, they lost their turn in queue. And then that happens again. So they lose the context. They lose essentially the momentum. And a simple access request or a simple provisioning request can easily, easily become a couple of days of ping pong back and forth. 
okay? This won't happen with the, with the virtual assistant. You know, I think, you know, and, and you mentioned chatbots, but also RPA is out there. You've seen a lot of that sure. growth. One of the hard things, and you brought this up, I want to get your reaction to, is mm -hmm. it's contextualizing mm -hmm. um, the workflow. It might not be apparent, but the answer might be there, but it, it disrupts the entire experience at that point. RPA and chatbots don't have that contextualization. Is that what you guys do differently? Is that the unique flavor here? Is that yes, the difference it, between it, current chatbots and RPA? What's the, the, the way we see it, I alluded to the intent-based operations. Let me give a tangible experience, mm -hmm. even not from our own world, this, this will be easy. It's a bi-directional feedback loop, because that's actually what feeds the context and the intent, okay? Um, we all know ways, right, <laughs> in the world of navigations. They didn't bring navigation systems uh, to the world. What they did is they took the concept of navigation systems that are typically satellite guided and said, it's not just enough to drive down the 280, which typically has no traffic, <laughs> right? <laughs> and to uh, come across traffic and say, oh, why didn't my uh, satellite uh, pick that up? So they said, have the end users, the end nodes, feed that direction back, that, that feedback, right? It has mm -hmm. to be a bi-directional feedback loop that the end nodes help educate the system, make the system be better, more customized. And that's essentially what we're allowing, the end users. Uh, so the maintenance of the system isn't entirely in the hands of the operators, right? Because that's the part that they dread. The, the, and uh, the maintenance of the system is, is democratized across all the users, that they can teach a system give input to the system, hone in the system in order to make it more of the DNA of the organization. You and I were talking before we came on this camera interview, you said playfully that the Siri for DevOps, <laughs> which kind of implies, hey, infrastructure, do something for me. Like, um, you know, sure, we all know Siri, good. you know, so we get that. So that kind of illustrates kind of the, the nerve, where the direction is. is the, explain why you say that, what does that mean? Is that like a North Star vision that you guys are approaching, you want to, have a state where everything's automated and there's conversational deployments, uh, that kind of thing. And take us through why that Siri for DevOps is. Uh, I, I think it helps anchor people to what a virtual assistant is because when you hear virtual assistant, that can mean any one of, of various connotations. So the Siri is actually a conversational, uh, yeah. <laughs> right, assistant, but it's not, but it's not necessarily an, uh, a virtual assistant. So what we're saying is, we're taking, anchoring people to that uh, thought yeah. and saying, we're actually allowing it to be operational, uh, com uh, turning complex operations into simple conversations. Yeah, I mean, basically they take the automate with voice, a Google search or a query, what's mm -hmm. the score of the game? And, and, and it also, in talking to the guy who invented Siri, actually interviewed him on theCUBE, mm -hmm. it yeah. gets, it's a learning system. It actually learns as it gets more Certainly. usage it learns. How do you guys see that evolving in DevOps? There's a lot of jargon in DevOps, a lot of configurations, okay. a lot of different use cases, a lot of new technologies. What's the secret sauce behind what you guys do? Is it the conversational AI, is it the machine learning, is it the data, is it the model? Take us through the secret sauce. In fact, it's all of the above. And I don't think we're bringing any one element to the table that hasn't been explored before, hasn't been done. It's, it's a recipe, right? You give uh, two people the same ingredients, they can have completely different results in terms of what they come out with. We, because of our domain expertise in DevOps, because of our familiarity with developer workflows, with operators, we know how to give a very well-suited recipe, right? Uh, five course meal, <laughs> hopefully with Michelin stars, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as part of that. So. A few things, maybe a few of the secret sauce elements, conversational AI, the ability to essentially go and, and extract the intent of the user so that if we're missing context, we, the system is smart enough to go and to get that feedback and to essentially feed itself into that model. Okay. Someone might Sorry. say, hey, you know, conversational AI, that was yesterday's trend. It never happened, sure. it was kind of sure. weak. Chatbots were lame. <laughs> What's different now and with you guys and the market that makes a, re a redo or a second shot at this, a second bite at the apple, as they say. As they say. What do you guys see? Because you know, I would argue that it's, you know, it's still early, real early. Certainly. How do you guys view that? How would you handle that objection? That, it, it's, it's a fair question. I wasn't around the first time around <laughs> to tell you what didn't work. Uh, yeah, I'm not afraid uh, to, to share that 
the feedback that we're getting is phenomenal. People understand that we're actually uh, customizing the workflows, mm -hmm. the intent-based uh, operations to really help hone in on the dark spots, like on the, um, uh, the way we call it, uh, last mile, uh, <laughs> you know, bottlenecks. And that's really where we're helping. We're helping, um, in a way, tribalize internal knowledge that typically hasn't been documented because it's painful enough to where people care about it, but not uh, painful enough to where you're gonna go and sit down an entire day and document it. <laughs> and that's essentially what the virtual assistant can do. It can go and, and get into those crevices and help document and operationalize all of those toil <laughs> yeah. in, into workflows. Yeah, I mean, some will call it grunt work or low level work. And I think the automation is interesting. I think we're seeing this in a lot of these high scale situations mm -hmm. where the, the talented, hard to hire person oh. is hired to do say things that be, were hard to do, but now harder things are coming around the corner. So, you know, serverless is great and all this is good, but it doesn't mm -hmm. make it the complexity go away. As these inflection points continue yeah. to drive more scale, the complexity kind of grows, but at the same time, so is the ability to abstract away the complexity. So you start to see the smart, higher guns move to higher, bigger problems. And the automation seems to take the low level kind of like capabilities or, or the toil or the grunt work or the low level tasks that mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want a high salaried person doing. Or, I mean, it's not so much that they don't want to do it. They'll take one for the team, as you said, or take it on the chin, but there's other things to work on. I, I want to add one more thing because this goes into essentially what you just said. Think about it's not the virtual assistant, what it gives you is not just the intent, uh, and, and that's one element of it, is the ability to carry your operations with you to the place where you're not breaking your workflows. You're actually comfortable operating. So the virtual assistant lives inside of a command line interface. It lives inside of chat like Slack and, and Teams and Mattermost and so forth. It also lives within a low code editor. So we're not forcing anyone to, to use uncomfortable language or, uh, or operations that they're not comfortable with. It's almost like Siri. It travels in your mobile phone, it's on your laptop, it's with you everywhere. Yeah, That's it, it, ma it makes total sense. And the reason why I like this, mm -hmm. and I, I want to get your reaction on this, because we've done a lot of interviews with, the, uh, with DevOps over the years. We've been at every KubeCon <laughs> since sure. it started. Um, and Kubernetes kind of highlights the value of the containers at the orchestration level. But what's really going on is the DevOps developers mm -hmm. in the CI CD pipeline, they're with infrastructure as code, they basically have a infrastructure configuration at their disposal all the time. Mm -hmm. And all the ops challenges have been around that the repetitive mundane tasks that most people do. There's like six or seven main use cases in DevOps. So the guardrails need, just need to be set. So it sounds like you guys are going down the road of saying, hey, here's the use cases. You can bounce around these use cases all day long Absolutely. and just keep doing your jobs because they're bolting on infrastructure to every application. There's one more element to this that we haven't really touched on. It's not just workflows and use cases, but it's also knowledge, right? Tribal knowledge. We, yeah. it's like. Uh, you asked me for an example, you can type or talk to the assistant and ask how much am I spending on AWS on US East One on so-and-so customer environment last week and it will know how to give you that information. <laughs> can I ask, can I, should I buy reserve instances or not? Can, you, can I ask that question? Because there's always good trade-offs between buying the reserve instances. I mean, that's, that's kind of the thing that. This is where our ecosystem actually comes in handy because we're not necessarily going to go down every single domain and try to be <laughs> the experts in here. We can tap into yeah. the partnerships API. We have full extensibility and API and the software development kit that goes into. The, it's those. interesting, opinionated and, and declarative are buzzwords in, in developer language. <laughs> oh, so you start to get into this editorial thing mm -hmm. so I can bring up an example. Sure. Hey, um, <laughs> Cube. Um, give, implement the best service mesh. Okay, what answer does it give you? Because well, there's different choices, you know? Maybe it, you go. <laughs> well, well, this is actually where the operator, if, you know, there's clearly guardrails, yeah. okay? Like you can go and say, I want to spin up a machine and we'll give you all of the machines on AWS. It doesn't mean you have to get the X1 large. That's good for a SAP environment, yeah. right? You could go and have guardrails in place where only the ones that are relevant to your team, ones that have resources and, and, and budgetary, uh, you know, uh, guidelines yeah. uh, can be. So, 
the operator still has all the control. Yeah. It's, I was kind of tongue in cheek around the editorialize, but actually the, the answer seems to be, as you're saying, whatever the customer decided their service mesh is. So mm -hmm. I think this is where it gets into, and as an assistant to architecting and operating. That seems yes. to be the real value. Now, code snippets is a different story because that goes on to the web, that goes on to Stack Overflow, and, and that's actually one of the things. So the, inside the CLI, you could actually go and, and ask for code snippets, and we could actually go and populate that. It's a smart CLI. So that's actually yeah. one of the things that are an added value of, of that. You know, I was saying to a friend, we were talking about open source and how we, when I grew up, there was no open source. Sure. Now, if you're a developer now, I mean, there's so much code. That it's not so much coding anymore as it is connecting and integrating. Certainly. And writing glue layers, if you will. I mean, it's still code, but it's not, you don't have to build it from scratch. There's so much code out there. Understood. This low code notion of smart, a smart system is interesting because it's very matrix-like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it yeah. can build its own code. Yes, but I'm also a little wary with low code and no code. I think part of the problem is we're so constantly focused on categories and categorizing ourselves yeah. and different categories take on a life of their own. So low code and no code is not necessarily even, even though we have the low code editor, we're not necessarily considering ourselves low code yeah. <laughs> solution. So. Serverless, no code, low code. <laughs> I, I'm, I, yeah. was, I was thrown on a term the other day, architectureless, um, <laughs> as, as a joke. <laughs> we, don't, no, we don't need architecture. There's uh, a use case around that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, yeah, we do. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Show me my AWS architecture and, and, uh, and it will build out the architecture diagram for you. The, again, serverless, architecture, this is all part of infrastructure as code. At sure. the end of the day, the developer has infrastructure at, with code and can, how they deploy it is mm -hmm. the nirvana. That's what we've been striving for. Sure, but infrastructure is code. You can uh, destroy, uh, you know, a Terraform. You can go and create one. It's not necessarily going to operate it for you, yeah. right? That's kind of where this comes in on top of that. So it's really complementary to infrastructure. All right. So code. final question before we get into the origination story: Data and security are two hot areas we're seeing fill the IT gap that has moved into the developer role. IT is essentially provisioned by developers now, but the ops side shifted mm -hmm. to large scale, SRE-like environments, security and data are critical. How do you, what's your opinion on those two things? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want me to give you the normal data as gravity? No, uh, I mean, uh, so you agree that IT is now is, is kind of moved into the developer realm, but the, real, the new IT is data ops and security ops basically. 100% and the lines are so blurred, like who, who's what in today's world? I mean, I, I can tell you I've, I've, I've customers who call themselves five different roles in, in the same day. So it's, you know, at the end of the day, I call them operators because I don't want to offend anybody <laughs> because <laughs> that's, that's just the way it is. Architecturalist, we're going to have, we're going to come back to that. Well, I know we're going to see you at KubeCon. And, yes. Um, we should get a catch up there. And, and talk more. I'm looking forward to seeing how you guys Likewise. get the feedback from the marketplace. It should be interesting to hear. Um, the, the curious question I have for you is, what, what was the origination story? Why did you guys come together? Was it a shared problem? Was it a big market opportunity? Was it an itch you guys were scratching? Did you feel like you needed to come together and start this company? What was the real yeah. vision yeah. behind the origination? Take, take a minute to explain the story. No, I, absolutely. So uh, I've been living in Palo Alto for the last couple of years. Uh, previous also a founder. So, you know, from my perspective, I always saw myself getting back in the game. Um, spent a few years in AWS, uh, essentially managing uh, partnerships for tier one DevOps partners. Um, you know, all of the known players, uh, some in public, some of them not. Uh, and, and really the itch was there, right? I saw what everyone's doing. I started seeing uh, consistency in the pains that, that I was hearing back in terms of what hasn't been solved. So I already had an opinion where I wanted to go. And when I was uh, visiting actually uh, Israel with uh, uh, the family, I was introduced by a mutual friend uh, to Shaked, Shaked Eskayo, my, my co-founder, CTO, amazing guy, unbelievable technologist, probably one of the most uh, you know, impressive folks I've had a chance to work with. And uh, he actually solved a very similar problem uh, you know, in his own way, in a previous company, uh, Blue Vine, where a fintech company, where he was head of SRE, having to essentially uh, oversee 200 developers in a very small team. The ratio was 
incongruent <laughs> to what the three guideline would you know. as, as more than 10x rate developer. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and sure enough, and yeah. just imagine it's four different time zones, yeah. right? Um, he finished his day shift and he already had the U.S. team coming asking for a question. He said, this is kind of he a... He got to clone himself, basically. He, well, yes, <laughs> he essentially said to me, I had no day, I had no life, but I had corona, <laughs> I had COVID, <laughs> which meant I could work from home I essentially programmed myself in the form of a bot. <laughs> essentially, when people came to me, I said, don't talk to me, talk to yeah, the bot. Yeah, yeah. Now, that was a different generation. It was yeah, a different just concept. a trivial example, but the idea was to automate the same Self queries service. all the time. Uh, there's, an, there's an answer for that. Go here. And mm -hmm. that's the benefit of it. Yes. Yeah, so he was able to see how easy it was to solve. I mean, how effective it was solving 70% of the toil in his organization, scaling his team uh, frozen headcount and the de developer team kept on going. So that meant that he was doing some right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you have a problem, you need to solve it. You're, the uh, the creativity comes out of the woodwork, you know. You know Invention is the mother of necessity. So final question yeah. for you, what's next? Got the launch. What do you guys hope to do over the next six months to a year? Hiring, put a plug in for the company. Oh, uh, what are yeah. you guys looking to do? <laughs> um, take a minute to, to uh, share the future vision and, and get a plug in. 100%. So Kubia, as, as you can imagine, um, announcing ourselves uh, at KubeCon, so in uh, a couple weeks, um, opening the gates uh, towards uh, the public uh, beta and NGA in the next couple uh, months, essentially working with dozens of customers, uh, Aston Martin, Zen Business, uh, Earning. We have quite a few. Uh, our website's full of quotes. <laughs> you can go ahead. Uh, but, but effectively, uh, we're looking to go on to, to bring the next operator, generation of operators who value their time, who value uh, the, essentially the value of tribal knowledge that travels between organizations that can be essentially shared. How many customers do you guys have in your pre-launch table? Uh, it's above, above a dozen. Uh, Without saying, because we're actually uh, uh, looking to onboard 10 more next week. So <laughs> that's just an, uh, an understanding. <laughs> it changes from day to day. What's, what's, the, what's the number one thing people are saying about you? You got that right. Okay. I know it's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a, a little bit more, you it's know. It's okay. It can be cocky. Startups are good. So, you know, <laughs> but I mean, they're, obviously they're using the product and they're getting good feedback. The, it's the saving thing time. Is, it says that this is a dream product. Got it right. What are some of the I things? I think anybody who doesn't feel the pain won't know, but the folks who are in the trenches, who are feeling the pain, who are experiencing this toil, who know what this means, they said, you're doing this different, you're doing this right. You, you architected it right, you know exactly what the developer workflows, you know, where all, uh, where all the areas, you know, where all the skeletons are hidden <laughs> within that. <laughs> and, and, and you're, you're yeah. attending to that. So, so we're happy about that. Yeah, everybody wants to clone themselves. Again, the tribal knowledge, I think this is a great mm -hmm. example of where we see the world going. Make things autonomous, operationally automated. For yeah. the use cases you know are locked solid, why wouldn't you just deploy? Exactly, and we have a very generous free tier people can yeah. yeah, here's a plug-in. You yeah. can uh, sign up for free uh, till the end of the year. We have a generous free tier. Um, yeah, free forever tier as well. So uh, we're, we're looking for, for yeah. people to try us out and, and to give us feedback. I think the self-service, I think the point is, we've, we've talked about on the Cube at our events, mm -hmm. everyone says the same thing. Every developer wants self-service, period, full stop, done. What they don't say is they need somebody to help them babysit <laughs> <laughs> to make sure they're doing it right. <laughs> the old the old dashboard, green, yellow, red. <laughs> well, you know, you know. I know it's an analogy yeah. that's not related, but have you been to Whole Food? Have you gone through their self service line? That's the beauty of it, right? Having someone in a loop helping you out throughout the time. You don't get confused if, if something's not working, someone's helping you out. That's what people want. They want a human in the loop or a human like in the loop. Yeah, yeah. We're giving that next best thing. Yeah, it's really the ratio. It's scale. It's a it's a it's a scaling. It's multi, multi, multi force multiplier for sure. I mean, thanks for coming on. Congratulations. Hey, thank you so um, much. See you at KubeCon. Thanks for coming in, sharing the story at the Cube. KubeCon. KubeCon. No, okay. <laughs> KubeCon. At the Cube. <laughs> Cube in Hebrew. Kubia. Kubia. Here, founder, <laughs> co-founder, and CEO here. Sharing the story in the launch, conversational AI for DevOps, the series of DevOps, really kind of changing the game, bringing efficiency, solving a lot of the pain points 
of large scale infrastructure. This is the Cube, Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much.